Today is Ash Wednesday here in Hubbardston, Massachusetts. We begin the Solemnity of Lent with the epistle from the prophecy of Joel, chapter 2. Thus saith the Lord, Be converted to me with all your heart in fasting and in weeping and in mourning. And rend your hearts and not your garments and turn to the Lord your God. For he is gracious and merciful, patient and rich in mercy and ready to repent of the evil. Who knoweth but he will return and forgive and leave a blessing behind him, sacrifice and, and libation to the Lord your God. Blow the trumpet in Sion, sanctify a fast, call a solemn assembly, gather together the people, sanctify the church, assemble the ancients, gather together the, the little ones, and them <clears throat> that nurse at the breasts. Let the bridegroom go forth from his bed, and the bride out of her bride chamber. Between the porch and the altar, the priests, the Lord's ministers shall weep, and shall say, Spare, O Lord, spare thy people, and give not thine inheritance to reproach, that the heathens should rule over them. Why should they say among the nations, Where is their God? The Lord has been zealous for his land, and has spared his people, and the Lord answered and said to his people, Behold, I will send you corn and wine and oil, and you shall be filled with them. And I will no more make you a reproach among the nations, saith the Lord Almighty. The Holy Gospel. Taken from St. Matthew chapter 6. At that time Jesus said to his disciples, When you fast, be not as the hypocrites, sad, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Amen, I say to you, they have received their reward. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thy head, and wash thy face, that thou appear not to men to fast, but to thy Father who is in secret, and thy Father who seeth in secret will repay thee. Lay not up to yourselves treasures on earth, where the rust and moth consume, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up to yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither the rust nor moth doth consume, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where thy treasure is, there is thy heart also. Thus are the words of the sacred scripture. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. Please pray in this Mass for uh, Mr. Lawrence Purdy. He's uh, out of Nevada. When we go out there for Mass in Nevada, he comes. He had a heart attack this morning, and he was in operation when I got the phone call. So pray for Lawrence Purdy. Where your treasure is, there is your heart. Where your treasure is, there is your heart. And our Lord gave his heart to us, opened on the cross, pouring out all his blood for our souls. And this is, this is the time of mercy. This is the time of, as long as we're on this earth, we have hope to obtain heaven. And we have hope to have escaped the fires of hell. And it is true, most of the mass of mankind are damned. That is true. Christ himself teaches it. Wide is the road to hell, most travel thereon. Narrow is the road, the path, rather, the path. Narrow is the path to heaven, few there are that find it. So we, we have to want this happiness of heaven. We have to cut the temptations and the pleasures and the vanities and the avarice and greed and all that of this world to obtain heaven. And Christ even says it himself, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. Only the violent take it. 
How well athletes know this. Everyone wants to win the trophy, but only those who work hard for it and sweat and discipline and come under a, a grueling series of daily practice and even a certain diet, they, they have to fight hard to win the trophy. As some coaches say, you got to give 110% in practice and you'll give 100% in the game. So it is for the kingdom of heaven, we have to fight to win it. We have to pray to obtain it. We have to desire to see the face of God. And this is why Lent is so precious. Really, it's a great grace because Christ says, unless you do penance for all of us, unless we do penance, we shall all likewise perish. In other words, we won't save our soul without penance, without prayer, without fasting, without almsgiving. And this is a beautiful time Mother Church gives us to imitate Christ's 40-day fast. We unite our little fastings of Mother Church's regulations, which is down to one full meal and two smaller meals a day. That's not much. Some people even live on less during the rest of the year. But the main thing is not so much the quantity of food, although we, we should do this in this, uh, the traditional spirit of the Church, but the main thing, says St. Leo the Great, is to fast from sin. Fast from sin. So ask the Holy Ghost, show me in thy light my sins. Show me the, what I must work on, what virtues I need to especially practice. And that's what we want to focus on during this Lent. St. Anthony of Padua, he mentions three main sins that most fall into. And other saints have said this also. Sins of youth which is lust, 55. sins of the Middle Ages, avarice, and sins of older age, and all ages, really, pride. <clears throat> Here's what St. Anthony says, St. Anthony of Padua. It's very precious what he says here. <clears throat> but, but thou, when thou fastest, he's quoting the Gospel, there are many who fast throughout these forty days and yet persist in their sins, these do not anoint their heads. As Christ told us, anoint your heads. What does he mean? Note that there are three kinds of ointment. Oint, ointments, ointments which soothe the skin, that which corrodes, and that which stings. The first ointment is made of the remembrance of death. The second ointment of the presence of the coming of the judge. The third, the fires of hell. A head may be blistered or full of warts or covered in a rash. So these are the three kinds of conditions of skin, St. Anthony says. Blistered, warts, or rashes. A blister is, weep is a weeping sore in the skin. A wart is an outgrowth of the flesh, an excess. A rash is a dry scabbiness which is unsightly. Exactly. These three represent three sins. The blistered skin is pride, the warts, avarice, and the rash, entrenched lust. Do you, O proud man, bring back before your mind's eye the reduction of your body to ashes, to decay and stench. So what is a cure for our pride, says St. Anthony? Think about that we're, when we die, we're going to return to ashes. We're going to be eaten by maggots. We're going to decay and stink. That's what we're going to be, our body. So that humbles our pride. Because all of us are suffering the sentence of death. And all of us will be buried. Where then will be your pride of heart? Where your boasted riches? Windy words will then cease, just as a blister bursts at the prick of the needle. When these things are thought about inwardly, they anoint the blistered skin. That is, they humble the proud mind. So when we're tempted to pride, says St. Anthony, think about our death. Think about our rottingness, 
St. Alphonsus says this also, and he goes into greater detail of rotting bodies and decaying and all that. <clears throat> but it's a fact. And, he, <coughs> and the humble, this pulls us back to humility, what we're going to be in our body. So what will really matter when we die, what will really matter is, have I loved God with all my heart, all my strength, all my soul? And have I loved my neighbor for the love of God? So these are the things we, we really want to focus on, especially in this Lent. Humble our pride. Next, the sin of avarice. That's compared to a wart. <coughs> and do you, O miser, remember the last assize, where there is the angry judge, the executioner ready to torture, the accusing demons, the gnawing conscience. Then, as the prophet Ezekiel says, Thy silver shall be cast forth, and thy gold shall become a dunghill. That is, all the bank accounts will not matter anything when we are dying. Thy silver and thy gold shall not be able to deliver thee in the day of the wrath of the Lord, says Ezekiel chapter 7, verse 19. And then St. Anthony of Padua goes on, When these things are carefully considered, they corrode, all riches corrode, and cut out the warty superfluities, and share them among those who have not even the necessities of life. Do you, I pray, when you fast, anoint your head with this ointment, so that what you take from yourself you may bestow on the poor. So what is the cure for avarice, for greed, for uh, too much interest in material gain? What's the cure for this? Give of your gifts. Give of your, of your wealth. Give of your time also. Give of what you have. And that's called almsgiving. Giving to the poor. Give to the poor. And this is very touching in God's eyes. Mm -hmm. He loves to see us generous towards those in need. And it doesn't only mean those begging in the streets for some food. Mm -hmm. But the, our Lord, the Gospels and the Scriptures mm -hmm. show us in the seven works of mercy, the seven works of charity. You see someone excessively sad, console them. Mm -hmm. Someone confused, give them some light. Give them a website to show them where traditional Catholic teaching can be heard and studied. So in uh, Navasoto, people try to lead them to tradition. And those outside the church lead them into the church, into the Catholic faith. So this is the real works of mercy. And what else? Admonish the sinner. We're all poor sinners, so none of us can look down on any sinner because we don't know how many graces other people have received. <coughs> We have probably received so many graces that we should be, all of us, saints by now. But we threw away so many graces. Mm -hmm. I can speak for myself. But we cannot, uh, with our neighbor, we can't, we can't know what graces they've received or how many or how many they've rejected. So when we correct sinners, we've got to correct them as a, with a brotherly charity. Knowing, says St. Paul, knowing that we can fall ourselves. So we want to correct those in sin, but in a, in a good way. In a good way, with charity, humility, and patience, and meekness. So these are the, uh, the and many other works of mercy, the seven spiritual works, the seven corporal works. Review those as Lent. And then Saint Anthony speaks here about the third uh, skin condition, which is the rash. So the blisters is pride, that's healed by remembering we're, we're going to be dust and ashes, as we just received the ashes. The second condition of the skin that needs ointment is the warts. And how are warts cut down? They are cut down by giving of ourselves for the, the poor and our neighbor, out of love for God. And then the last is the rash. The rashes that itch and stay and persist and keeps, keep begging to be itched and itched and itched. This is the sin of lust. So here's what St. Anthony says. And do you, O lustful man, remember the unquenchable fires of hell, where there is undying death, an endless end, where death is sought and desired and not found, 
where the damned gnaw their own tongues and curse their Creator. The wood for this fire in hell consists in the souls of sinners, and the breath of God's anger makes it blaze. So Isaiah chapter 30 says, For Topheth, that is, hell, is prepared from yesterday, that is, from eternity, which is but yesterday to God, deep and wide, the nourishment thereof is fire and much wood, the breath of the Lord as a torrent of brimstone kindling it. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 33. And then St. Anthony concludes, Behold the stinging ointment which heals the, en the entrenched lust of the mind. Just as a key is pushed out by a key, so these, when pondered carefully, that is, the pains of hell, drive out the sting of lust. Do you, when you fast, anoint your head with this ointment? So, the ointments we want to anoint our skin with, pride, we're dust and ashes, and we're going to die, and we're going to be rotten and food for maggots. For the sin of avarice, the over, over thirst for material things, give of these material things. That's why it's a good practice, especially for American children who have a lot of toys and a lot of material things. It's a good practice, especially in Lent. Give some of their toys to other kids who don't have. Give something they really like and treasure to those who don't have it. And then the third, for, for the lustful, that is the rash skin, what's the cure? Is the sting of remembering the fires of hell. St. Philip Neri said, Go often down into hell, and you won't go there. Go down into hell in prayer. Go down into hell in meditation. And it's not going to kill us. And think of saints who have actually gone down into hell and suffered some of its pains, such as St. Saint, um, well, Sister Josefa Menendez, the three, <coughs> children of, the three children of Fatima saw hell, and then, and then some of the chosen, St. Catherine of Bologna, and St. Mary Magdalene de Pazzi, some of these chosen mystics went down into hell. And they say it's un, undescribable, the sufferings in hell, the frightful sufferings. And they see some souls with their tongues being lacerated continually with knives by the devils. They're tied down. Some can't move in hell for all eternity. They just can't move. But they're roasting to a crisp. They're dying of thirst. And they hate God. All they do is hate God, and they hate each other. And if they, in hell they happen to be thrown in a place where they recognize people they knew on earth, or maybe family members or relatives or old friends, who are in hell, it's not going to be, oh, hi, it's nice to see you after so long. Haven't seen you in 5,000 years. It's not going to be that way. They're going to just curse and hate each other forever and ever and ever. So it's good for all of us to go down into hell and think of the fires of hell. It's very healthy for us. And St. Anthony is recommending it to all of us, especially with temptations against purity. The, and we live in a very impure, soaked world. We need to think of the fires of hell. The fires of hell will remind us you don't want to go there. And the descriptions of hell are tremendous. The, the descriptions of those who have seen it. The, and there's even parts of hell where it's so freezing cold the bones crack and break. And you, the bones of the resurrected body, because the body, right now it's the only the souls in hell. But after the resurrection of the dead, the body will also share in the suffering of the soul. So the body will be like ripped up, broken apart, torn apart by the devils, stabbed to pieces, and then, and then come back together again. And then repeat the whole process over and over and over again. And this is not, you know... Um, this is, this is the, what I can tell you about hell, just, just what I've read of saints, they all say the same thing. Picture the worst suffering you can imagine on this earth. Drowning, burning, 
roasting, whatever it is, being crushed to death, it is still nothing compared to the torments of hell. Yeah, they would. And then remember with the description from Sister Lucia, she said they saw the beasts of hell, the frightful devils of hell, who frighten the damned and torment them. So this is why Mother Church puts ashes on our head. And of course, many times the Protestants mock this practice of the Catholic Church. And they say, why do you put ashes? This is not, Christ says, go to your room and pray so nobody sees it. Why are you going to display your ashes? Well, let's look at sacred scripture. How many times God is moved by the people who humbled themselves with prayer, with tears for contrition for their sins and putting on ashes and also dung, in the case of Esther, she put on animal dung on her as well. And they put on sackcloth, that is uncomfortable, scratchy clothing during Lent. So think of Isabella the Queen, the great Catholic Queen of Spain. She was marvelously beautiful, and she was respected by everybody. And everybody loved their queen in Spain. They just loved her. They would die for her. Soldiers would die gladly for her. But underneath her silk dress and her diamond earrings and under her beautiful garments, underneath all that was a hair shirt that she wore that scraped her skin out of penance to keep her humble. And think of St. Louis the Ninth, who gave to his daughter who got married, he gave her a little wooden box and a gift inside the box because she would now be elevated to the court life and to be honored by all men and very dangerous for vainglory and pride. And so what, what did her father, St. Louis IX, give to his daughter? It was a, a whip, a discipline, to whip her back before the crucifix at night sometimes, to put her back in her place. And Archbishop Lefebvre says this often, let's, let's contemplate who we are before God. I am nothing, God is everything. In St. Francis of Assisi, my God, thou art my God and my all. Thou art everything, I am nothing. That's the real picture. And to use the, the Thomistic terms of Archbishop Lefebvre, which he, he loved to meditate on this, and we should also, which is, God, my God, thou art ends us say. You are being from yourself. You never had a beginning. You never had, you'll never have an end. You are all creation, all creation comes from thee. Thou art ends ase, being from thyself. And who am I? Ends ab alio. I am a creature from another, created from the cooperation of God and my parents. I have a birthday and I'm going to have a death day. So we are nothing before God. And all that we have, think of this, our body, our soul, intelligence, will, memory, abilities, talents, skills, whatever you have, whatever we have, it's not even ours. God gave it to us. And we're supposed to use this for His glory. So even what we have that we think is ours is not really ours. God gave it to us. And that's why St. Jerome says, what, I, what can I claim as my own? My sins. That's about it. My spitting on God my crucifying our Lord, my whipping Him at the scourging, my crowning Him with thorns, and adding to His tortures by my sins. That's what I can claim as my own. And for these we want to weep and ask God mercy by making good acts of contrition every day. During Lent, don't let any day go by without thinking of our Lord's suffering and passion. And especially in this Lent, I encourage you, let that be the focus of your Lent. Christ's suffering. And there's many good uh, studies, actually good documentaries you can find on the sufferings of Christ in the Shroud of Turin. They keep finding more and more discoveries on the Shroud. The amount of blood loss of our Lord. He shouldn't have survived after the scourging. And then the, the beatings. And then the, the suffocation on the cross for three hours. The sufferings of our Lord. Imagine the, the Virgin Mary listening to our Lord trying to breathe on the cross. 
whistling air, and then the, the, the pain of hanging suspended on nails, and she, she sees drops of blood falling <laughs> onto the ground, and she hears our Lord panting for air. What mother could endure that, seeing their son panting for air as, as he's dying? That any mother would break, that would break any mother's heart and father's heart. Watching one of their own sons or daughters die in front of them, panting for air. So think of the sufferings of our Lord in His sacred face, His heart, His, His, His hands and feet, His whole body from top to bottom. And our Lord loves this very much when we think of His suffering. And His, his blood becomes like a shield against temptation. So let me just uh, round, round, wrap this up by some of the quotes reminding us from the Holy Ghost of the importance of dust and ashes, prayer and fasting. Uh, Job chapter 42 verse 6, Therefore I reprehend myself, I accuse myself like we do in confession, and do penance in dust and ashes. Daniel 9.3 and I set my face to the Lord my God to pray and make supplication with fasting and sackcloth and ashes. 1 Maccabees 3.47 And they fasted that day and put on hair cloth and put ashes upon their heads and they rent their garments. Joel 2.12.8 which is in the Mass today Now therefore saith the Lord be converted to me with all your heart and fasting, and weeping, and in mourning, and rend your hearts, and not your garments, and turn to the Lord your God, for He is gracious and merciful, patient and rich in mercy, and ready to repent of the evil. And that's a strange word, isn't it, in the Scripture, in Joel. God is ready to repent of the evil. How does God repent? He never does anything wrong. He repents by withholding punishment, and chastisement. And we know the power of prayer, penance, sackcloth and ashes, and fasting, and almsgiving. We see the power of it with Nineveh. When Jonah went to preach at Nineveh, the huge city that took three days to walk through, and the people listened to God's warning through Jonah the prophet. And the king and all the animals even put on ashes, sackcloth, fasted and prayed with weeping for their sins. And God repented. That is, He changed from chastising the city to sparing them. And this is the also we want to remember. We are not just individual Catholics making our own penance. We're united to all the saints in heaven who need not penance. We're united to the souls in purgatory who are doing severe penance. And we're united to all the Catholics on earth who profess the Roman Catholic faith. And we want to unite all our sufferings with Jesus on the cross and the Immaculate Heart of Mary to beg God, have mercy on us. Put an end, repent from this chastisement that the mankind deserves. Certainly the physical chastisement, which has not hit hard yet, certainly not America. But the terrible chastisement of, of the apostasy, Give us, finally, O Lord, a good Pope who will consecrate Russia. Give us, finally, a converted Rome back to tradition. Give us true good priests, true good nuns and generous women to fill the convents again, faithful to tradition. This is what we must beg from heaven. And then beg also for ourselves. We belong to the mystical body of Christ, it's true, but we also will face God alone at our judgment. So we want to show our Lord, Lord, I am truly sorry for offending thee. I can't fast maybe like St. Anthony of the Desert. I don't think any of us can. <laughs> uh, if you try that for 40 days, you'll be in the hospital. But I can't do the whippings maybe of St. Bernard. And I can't do the severe standing in the frozen river praying the Psalms like St. Patrick. Lord, there are penances I know I can't do. But I'm going to give you what I can, a little less food. A little less sweet, sweet things, a little more patience, a little more prayer, a little more spiritual reading or listening. And these I will give you out of penance. I know I can do these little things. But do these little things during Lent out of great love for God. 
And if you do some of these little things out of great love for God, such as being more patient and uh, less, less uh, moody with the family and your brothers and sisters, for example, and you do that out of great love for God, it can be more pleasing to God than if you fasted on bread and water for 40 days. So do what we do out of great love for God, and we will learn this love at the crucifix, at the cross. And today, at this Mass, we go to Calvary, and Jesus Christ the King will set us off in Lent, feeding us with His own sacred body, drinking of His precious blood, to strengthen us, so we humble our souls, be contrite for our sins, and do the little we can do in this Lent out of great love for Him. O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, O Mary, conceived without sin. Pray for us, O Mary, conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <coughs>